UX Podcast Episode 269. You're listening to UX Podcast, coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. Helping the UX community explore ideas and share knowledge since 2011. We are your hosts, James Royal Lawson. And Pat Axpel. We have listeners in 199 countries and territories all around the world, from Egypt to Croatia. From time to time, we bring you a repeat show. This is an episode from our extensive back catalogue, resurfacing some of the ideas and thoughts from the past that we believe are still relevant and well worth revisiting. And today we are bringing you our conversation with Amber Case from the UXLX conference in 2016. Amber is a cyborg anthropologist and UX designer. We chat about the ideas expressed in Amber's popular TED talk, We Are All Cyborgs Now, before turning our attention to the notion of calm technology. Start us off by telling us a bit about cyborg anthropology. I mean, is that even th- something you can study, or did you make it up, or where does it come from? Sure. Uh, cyborg anthropology mm-hmm. is the study of human and computer interactions, more like how technology affects culture and how culture affects technology. So if you look back in time, you have uh, tools as an extension of the fist or an extension of your arm or a knife as an extension of your teeth, and those are real physical extensions of the self. And then we started to get into cave painting and writing, and those became more mental extensions of the self. And the thing that I study is is the the kind of transitory uh, stage that we're in, where the extension of our physical self is pretty stable. You have, you know, a knife that pretty much stays the same size and shape depending on the use. You have uh, a hammer as an extension of the fist. It's really the same shape, the same tool for millions of years. But when you look at a phone or you look at a computer, it's it's inherently unstable. Like the large computers in the past that were the size of a gymnasium, and now we have the same computing power in our hand, and now we can go mobile anywhere with it. So it's really about how these things change and how they've changed so quickly that they've become absorbed into our culture and we can't notice them as much. Because a traditional anthropologist goes out into another country and says, hmm, how interesting all these different people are. You know, look at their tools, look at their kinship relations, look at how their culture works, how strange they are. We usually mm-hmm. go to another country or, you know, to a to a quote-unquote first world country and say, oh, wow, we're so different from them and these are the people we study. And with cyborg anthropology, I, I really just wanted to say, no, you know, we're just as strange as anybody else. Why don't we turn the anthropological lens on ourselves and technology and start to understand how the technology is affecting us? And this is a subsection of the Anthropology of Science uh, that came out in 1993. And the whole idea was that we should treat the objects in our lives uh, like a traditional anthropologist would, but we should, we should treat these, these kind of techno-social devices that we have um, as, as interactions with our culture in the same way. So we kind of have this actor network theory from uh, anthropologist Bruno Latour, which talks about, you know, it's this human-computer interaction, but those computers are actually actors in our life in some ways just as much as humans. You know? And at this point, we wake up and we look at our phones sometimes before we do our partners, right? And so what does that mean when, when uh, we've evolved to have our stomachs be full when we eat too much food, but our brains don't get too full when we use a computer? You know, we don't have those cutoff points. And what does it mean to be addicted to technology, you know, technology itself is neutral unless acted upon by humans. Where did technology come from? There's all sorts of interesting things to think about. Um, and what I usually tell people is that we're all cyborgs because we all have some sort of thing that we attach to ourselves in order to either adapt to a new environment or to get a new sense. In this case, you connect to the Internet and you have a sense of all over the world and, and you can meet people on the inside instead of just the outside. And that's really interesting. Um but I think there's this big idea that, you know, cyborgs are, you know, Robocop or Terminator, 
when in reality the word cyborg came from a 1960 paper on space travel in which humans would attach exogenous components to themselves to adapt to new environments. Basically, humans aren't supposed to go anywhere. We're these weird, fleshy creatures, and we attach exoskeletons to ourselves to one day go undersea diving, where we can breathe underwater, and the next day maybe we go to space, or the next day we go to the Alps. And, you know, unlike other creatures, you know, many creatures attach things to themselves. We The, the rate at which we attach external appendages is ridiculous. We have so many mm-hmm. created objects, and... And so the idea is that technology evolves us and we evolve technology and we've been symbiotic since we first used things outside of ourselves. And so a lot of us are kind of low tech cyborgs in that we have things attached to ourselves sometimes and sometimes we don't. But in reality, when people say, oh, I'm not good at technology, you know, I say, well, you know, the new technology that you're not good at, it's really not good at you. You know, we haven't made things that are great for humans yet um, in terms of the newest technology. But if you look at old technology, you know, you, you see these these uh, hand axes that are perfectly shaped to somebody's hand. You know, you see uh, lawn mowers and you see dishwashers and, and someone says, well, I'm really not into technology. And I and I go through and I list every single thing they've used during the day. And I say, yes, you are. These are just things you're accustomed to. They're like the air you breathe. You no longer use them. And so when technology absorbs into our society and in a way that we don't notice it, like electricity, uh, in a way that we only notice it when it doesn't exist anymore, when it when it fails, you know, that's that's kind of this mature state of that technology. It becomes invisible. And and that's why I was really interested in writing this book on calm technology to kind of calm our modern technology that people are annoyed with mm. that beeps and buzzes at us all the time mm. into something that's is similarly uh, reliable as electricity um, and reliable as, as some of the things that that we use every day that we don't notice anymore yeah i was thinking that so with the as, as a cyborgs now and and if the screen you could say that was maybe the the like a first iteration of a cybernetic interface for us then it's actually a, a much later stage cybernetic interface, if you think about it. Oh, okay. If, if, yeah. if cyborgs are just something, you know, you attach things to, to adapt to new environments, then, you know, fire is kind of a cyborgian attachment. And, um, you know, I, I, well, really like a hammer and a, and a, and a knife are the, 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 the cyborg attachments because you attach mm-hmm. them to yourself for a bit of time in order to get a task done. And then mm-hmm. you switch it out for another thing. And unlike a, a saber-toothed tiger who has the knife in their mouth <laughs> that they've mm-hmm. evolved with, um, you know, we can just fit a new one onto our hand if it breaks. And so we have this kind of external evolution that we can do outside of ourselves. I think the screens are a, a nicely evolved version of a cave wall or a scroll because we're still scrolling like we did with the original scrolls, um, but we just have a, a faster rate um, that we can see data. You know, there were old uh, networks of letters uh, in the 16 and 1700s for all these scientists. They would write, and I, I just kind of call that, like, here's an early internet, right? Mm. The the transfer rates, like, two bytes a week, right? It's really slow. <laughs> but the information is transferred. So what we've, what we've seen is, yeah, we, we developed these communication tools and written language and, you know, all these cave wall paintings and these letters and these scrolls, but the rate in which we could exchange them was, was very slow. Um, you know, you can kind of think of like early communication, like smoke signals. That's, that's a pretty fast, low resolution internet, right? And you can see a smoke signal that gives you a message and now you know what to do based on that message. Mm-hmm. It's, it's this kind of mm-hmm. early, early, early Morse code. And so now we have a higher resolution of communication that's much faster, that spans the entire world. And so we can kind of have these micro singularity moments where, say, Michael Jackson dies and everybody knows around the same time mm. and everybody listens to the music. Um, or we have an earthquake that whose communication happens faster than the earthquake um, takes to get to other, <laughs> other sections of, of the city that it's affecting. We get this kind of... We get this this very fast communication that's much, much higher resolution. We have images and photos. We can see what somebody else has seen on the other side mm-hmm. of the world. But in reality, it's all an extension of, of, of how we've existed as early humans. And calling attention to it and saying, hey, this is a thing, and let's study it as cyborgs, 
um, is kind of a transitory phase in, in terms of anthropology. You know, eventually that will just become all anthropology as well. But because we've absorbed these technologies into our daily life so much that we don't notice them anymore, and we wake up with our phones, we use our computers every day, and we, we don't really think necessarily about how it's affecting us because we're in the flow, I think it's important to kind of separate that and say, hey, let's look at this. And instead of doing traditional anthropology, we turn the lens on ourselves and, and um, do anthropology on, on our own everyday lives. Hmm. You've described it as, because uh, now you're talking about exoskeletons and extending ourselves with tools, but you've called uh, this phenomenon of cyborg also as that we're extending our mental self and not just the physical self. Is that something that is different now in the information age, or is that also something that's been going on? That's also something that's been going on. The minute we took our communication <laughs> yeah. and we put it onto a, a, a cave wall, or we, uh -huh. or we took a stick and, and drew it in the sand, or we sent it to mm -hmm. somebody else, yeah. Early communication, right? And I think mm. that... Also, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 go on. I was just thinking about what you said about the uh, the network of scientists sharing letters. And also, it, um, right. it, it, you've got shared knowledge then. That by, by by sending a letter to someone else, then you've you've made a backup of your knowledge. So you've increased redundancy. So so back then, the redundancy was kind of really slow. You two bytes a, was it, a week or something. Then you know, it would take a long time to make your backup. Right. So if you got kind of killed in the meantime, your knowledge would vanish. So, so now we've increased the, the bandwidth, but also we've increased our redundancy. Exactly. Shared experiences, shared knowledge. So you have the knowledge that was mm. a, formerly available to the upper class starting to spread to everybody, that you can get it at any moment in time. And yeah. by the time mm. we saw the Canterbury Tales, which was one of the early books, just uh, this guy who, who wrote it said, hey, I have this inn, and if you give me a story, you can stay for free at the inn. You know, have, have a few minutes to stay. Yeah. And so he gets all these amazing, um, uh, you know, the, the, you have all these amazing stories that come from from random people, you know. So you know, Chaucer was this this brilliant person, you know, kind of uh, talking about this advertising format to get these stories, but you you get them from you know the the general public, which at that time was very rare because um, before that it was always nobles who were communicating with each other and people who had an education. Um, the ways of communicating, you know, early on, other than that, was either you have a Latin mass, but no one can understand it, so you have these giant stained glass windows that tell the story. Um, so, so now that every, you know, many people can read and write, many people have access to information, we become these kind of, our brains become these information network cells that can easily get information from other generations into them. I always think of the best way of backing yourself up is to write a best-selling book, because mm -hmm. as long as that's a best-selling classic book that, that can span generations, there's your brain, you know, there, there's part of your consciousness that can become a zip file and get downloaded into people's brains mm -hmm. if they read the book. Mm. So, speaking of books, <laughs> Calm Technology, uh, that's the book you wrote, and it's also the subject of the workshop you'll be giving at UXLX. So, what is the concept of Calm Technology? Uh, the concept of Calm Technology was developed by uh, John Seeley Brown and Mark Weiser at Xerox Park. In, in the 80s and 90s. And Xerox Park was this curious research lab. It was a division of that big copy print company that, that everybody uses or everybody used to use. And they had this R&D lab that didn't necessarily have to make money, but a lot of things were developed there. Um, people who worked there created Interpress, and, and then they created Adobe systems out of that. You had um, people who invented lots of different languages out of there, like um, you had Alan Kay who was part of it, who, who did small talk. You had the graphic user interface come out of there that was improved upon by, by uh, Steve Jobs and, and Bill Gates. You had so many amazing things come out of this place. And it, it was this space where you didn't have to think the same as everybody else. They had anthropologists and technologists in there. The ideas were flowing so quickly that as an engineer, you'd go up to the whiteboard and you try to write something, and then somebody else would interrupt you immediately and say, oh, oh, I also have an idea how to extend that. <laughs> and so the idea uh, was, oh, no, we need to slow down the rate of information here. So they put beanbag chairs in a lot of these spaces <laughs> so that um, if you had an idea and somebody tried to interrupt you, 
it would take them a long time to get out of the beanbag chair, and by the time they got out, <laughs> they actually have the information um, done on the board, and then they could add their piece. So there were all these ideas about information, just, just the way that they thought about friction and flow and time and communication was, was very clever and very unique. Mm. So um, mm. when I was doing my thesis on cell phones and their techno-social sites of engagement when I was in college, um, I, was, I, I found them, and I actually found them around 2006, I found this paper called The World is Not a Desktop by Mark Weiser. And Mark Weiser uh, passed away um, from cancer, and I was really upset at the time because here's somebody who said, one day we're going to have all of these little tiny things. He called he called the future a world of pads, tabs, and boards before any of this stuff existed. And he said, once we have these things in our worlds, uh, the scarcest resource in the 21st century is not going to be technology. It's going to be attention. How do we manage that? How do we make sure that we're not run over by all this technology and, and get to live our lives as humans and, and really amplify the human experience with our technology? He said that we need smarter people, not machines, and that the idea of intelligent technology is a misnomer. Technology should inform us so that we can make our best decisions, but it shouldn't do all the decision making for us. And he's also known as the father of ubiquitous computing, which some of us now know as the Internet of Things. It, they're not mm. an exact one-to-one -one correlation, but it's close enough that you could say that, hey, this person predicted, and also with, with a lot of other scientists and anthropologists in this lab, they created a future of mobile devices. They had um, the park tab. They had this thing that you wore around your neck that would sense that you got into Xerox Park and would turn on your computer in the background, which could take up the mm. 15 minutes in the past. So while you walked mm. in and got your coffee, by the time you got to your computer, everything was on. You had shared wow. desktop yeah. environments. You had live streaming. Mark Weiser's band, Severe Tire Damage, was the first band to ever live stream on the internet. They, uh, they got a really popular band whose name I always forget, but they got this popular band um, signed up to be the first band to live stream on the internet. And then they said yes. And then Weiser said, well, can we open for you guys? And then that I got it. <laughs> so, wow. um, so Mark Weiser was was a really cool character, and, and so was John Seeley Brown. And what they did is, is they came up with all these different papers. The idea of the world is not a desktop is that we can't interact with our environment like you would a desktop computer. A desktop computer can demand all of your attention. You can have lots of information on the screen. You're sitting there. Uh, ideally, nothing else is distracting you. You can write an essay. You can surf the Internet. But if you're on your mobile phone, chances are you're waiting for a bus you're in line for a checkout counter in a supermarket. Um, you have to get a thing done very quickly. You're trying to get a, a direction in your car, and you're trying to use it when you're on the road, which is horrible. Um, and, and what happens is a lot of this technology is designed to take all of our attention, when in reality only needs to take the least amount of attention possible to get the information through. So Mark Weiser talks about the, the idea of, of attention in your direct focus in front of you, which is super high resolution like on a desktop environment. And then as you go further and further away from that initial focus, you have less resolution uh, that you can pay attention to. And if you load all that complex information into your peripheral attention, you can get a lot more done without taking somebody out of that environment, without taking them out of their, um, their initial focus. And this becomes really interesting because uh, you, you can think of some of the calm technologies like a tea kettle. Like a tea kettle is really a bland piece of technology, but it's very innovative in that you set it, you forget it, you go somewhere else in your home, and it calls to you when it's done. It doesn't draw attention to itself until it needs it. And you can be in a different environment, do something completely different, and it will tell you when it's done. Um, there are not that many calm technologies out there. Because a lot of the computer technologies, you know, you sit there and you watch it and you wait. Or it gives you a buzz when it's done, but then when you open up your phone, you get all these other notifications too. So uh, Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown created these, these ideas, these kind of principles that technology should take the least amount of, of attention um, and, should, and should be in your life only when necessary and not without. So it should be invisible until you need it. Uh, or it should be invisible until you need it, 
and then you know disappear after its its use is fulfilled and go back into the periphery, right. and and then you know you can have these low resolution beeps and alerts and lights that tell you what's going on um, that you can just glance at. So if you're having a whole conversation with somebody and you notice something out of your peripheral attention and it's a, a soft tone, not a large beep or, you know, here's a light, you know that something's happened and you can go back to the conversation. You haven't stopped your conversation and picked up your phone and unlocked it and then looked at the message, responded to the message and gone back. But if one of those tones is more urgent, then you can stop what you're doing and attend to it. So there's this different way of communicating with reality where there's this kind of low-level language that's signaling to you, and you learn this kind of small language, which we're already kind of learning. You know, when when the clothing is done, it goes, you know, uh, a lot of the clothing, uh, a lot of the washing machines in the States are made for giant houses. So you want an incredibly loud signal uh, to tell you that the laundry is done so you can hear it in other parts of the house. And mm. it, it assumes that you aren't living in a place next to people. So now that a lot of Americans are, are living in condos and apartments, you need a very quiet washing machine. You know, it needs to be, um, in, in some cases, it needs to be slow and energy efficient, and it should have a nice, fun tone. You know, when you open it, it should go, da 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 you know, Hooray, you're mm. doing laundry because often they don't live alone. You know, they don't want their devices to be depressive. They want their devices yeah. to be excited. So da 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 you know, and then mm. I have a washing machine that sings when it's done. It goes dun da 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 It's from South Korea, so I, I got really excited. Like, <laughs> what country do I want to buy my machine from? How what personality do I want with mm. my machine? Uh, and so I tried them all out and I, and looked at the reviews online and instead of the, uh, you know, I got this D D D D D D and here's all the options. And it's really well. <laughs> they should list that in the specifications of the it's washing a, machine. It's like, instead of an energy, instead yeah. of an energy rating, there should be a happiness rating. Yes, exactly. Yeah, cheerfulness yeah. of your machine. <laughs> and a Roomba yeah. vacuum cleaner does the same thing, yeah. right? It, if it gets yeah. stuck, yeah. it goes dun dun and it kind of asks for your yeah. help. Uh, it doesn't just eat everything in sight, you know, like a regular vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if it's if it's clean, it go it, it finds its way back to its dock and goes, dee, 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 you know, I did the mm -hmm. thing, uh, right. which really helps. You know, you you kind of have this um, this character that's that's uplifting, and because it's not doing your task for you, you can help the robot. I think what people find endearing about the Roomba robot is that. It asks for your help, and sometimes you need to clean it, but it shows you with mm -hmm. either a tone or a light at the same time, and it changes color. So mm -hmm. you can kind of tell what you need to do without it, without it saying something with a regular human voice, like, excuse me, I need <laughs> cleaning right now, you know, which would be mm -hmm. absolutely obnoxious. But Yeah, I understood you're not so impressed by digital speech, are you? <laughs> No. <laughs> but also you've touched upon something now is that, well, all of these devices now, if they're all signaling something to me, how am I supposed to make sure that they don't talk on top of each other? I was just thinking the same yeah. thing. that kind of you've, All these you've, devices talking to me all the time. To stop you from drowning. Because yeah. yeah. think about it works on an individual basis, like when you've got a kettle or a mm. vacuum cleaner. Yeah. But when you're in this home where... You know, everything right. is singing to you. Or and everything. the Roomba is more cocky than the kettle and wants to say more than the kettle does. Yeah. yeah. So, so how, how do all these things have... How do you, how do you cope with the challenge of, of context for these things that they all, they all understand when there's just too much going on and you, you've, you need to be calmer? They all need to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, that's a great question. I mean, one of the principles of calm technology is that Technology can communicate, but doesn't need to speak. So whenever necessary, don't make it speak in a human language. Make it speak in um, status indicators, like lights or buzzes. I always think of birds, right? You have all these different birds, and no matter what, over a really noisy environment, they have different frequencies, like a radio would have frequencies. One finch bird has... Now, I'm listening to the birds outside my window right now. There's some finches out there, and sometimes there's hummingbirds, and sometimes there's blackbirds, and sometimes there's crows. There's all these different types of, of creatures out there, and they have their frequencies. And if you record some bird noises and play it back to the birds, you know, they will get, they'll be like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they'll, mm. they'll, you know, it's like playing back a human voice to humans. And I think it's, it's really important to, to notice when you're outside all of the different signals and sounds that are going on, these birds still can communicate with each other no matter what. 
Um, and they can communicate across long distances. You have the same with, uh, with whales and, and dolphins. You have echolocation. You have bats. You have all these different methods of communication that aren't necessarily, you know, that there's, they're not on the same frequency. And I think it's the same thing. You know, there should be kind of frequencies and unique tones for each device that, that are, are sonically tuned so that they can be heard above other information sources that aren't the same. Mm-hmm. And I think of a lot of device manufacturers, for a lot of device manufacturers, sound is often an afterthought or something that's tacked on at the end. You either get the default circuit board sound, which is jarring and horrible, um, mm. or you get some really tacky human voice design sound that, especially if you do it in American English, uh, you're going to have to translate it to like all these different languages to make it, to make it work around the world, which I find really stupid, you know. You don't need to do all those things. So setting some unique tone to your device, having a, a sound engineer, a sound designer come in and, and do this thing is, is incredibly important. And, you know, I'm thinking of writing an entire new book about just the sound design because it's the thing that it's really going to help. You know, if it's a, if it's a personal device, like an insulin pump, you don't want a sound on it. You want a buzz because it's, it's close to you. I had a, I had a, a, an employee who got an insulin pump, and I was sitting across from him one day, and, and I heard a beep. And I said, your insulin pump is beeping. And he said, yes, it's incredibly embarrassing because it's mm. this – I mean, it was a small tone, but in a quiet room, you can hear it. Um, and, of course, he can hear it, but he's not going to be able to hear it in a loud club. And if he's in a movie theater, it's going to beep and embarrass him. Right, like no one wants to be beeping, you know. You need to be able to turn that off. So um, instead, having an insulin insulin pump that that buzzes to let you know, you're always going to be able to feel that because that's a personal tone. So it's all about adjusting the tone and the notification to the context. You know, a buzz is going to work. You know, a tone might not work in all situations. A tone might work in your house. You know, but what happens if you're playing really loud music? Well, then a light's going to work, right? Like that. Like if you look at some of this modern technology, um, the the heat light on a stove is really straightforward. It says the surface is hot. You, know, you don't have a gas burning stove, and you you know you have a coil stove. You need to know whether the surface is hot, even though you know the nichrome wire that whatever that wire is um, is no longer uh, lit up. It's still hot, and so that little light you can be blasting any sort of metal music you want, but you can still understand it. So it's, it's really contextual. I think one of the best examples is, is the smoke detectors. Smoke detectors should have different sensors based on what room they're in. If you have one for your bedroom, it should be incredibly sensitive because you want to be able to wake up in the middle of the night. you know. Um, but in a kitchen, it should be turned down quite a bit because chances are you're going to make something accidentally that, that smokes things up. And what people are more embarrassed about when they're cooking is not if they fail, but if the fire alarm goes off, because everybody can hear it, especially in an apartment building. And hmm. uh, one of the things that, that was done for, for fire detectors is um, people, they found that people were just taking the batteries out and leaving them out hmm. because it was so hard to actually reach the fire detector right. and turn off the yeah. button. So they made a new type of, hmm. of fire detector that just had this giant button on it that you could hit with a broomstick, you know? So you mm. go, <laughs> so shut up, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Okay. Yeah. You can save yourself the embarrassment. So I'm assuming these are all examples of things that people will learn in your workshop. Absolutely. I'll, I'll take people yeah. through the, the, the principles, and I'll take people through the status indicators and a bunch of examples, and then I have exercises in the back that I'm going to take people through, which, you know, one of the exercises will be... Um, you know, design the most complicated, infuriating piece of technology you can. Ooh, I like oh, that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so at a workshop in Costa Rica, we had like just horrifying technology, like smart underwear that connects to Twitter and tweets out every time you, you know, like, start <laughs> and, um, and, and then uh, sends you notifications about gastrointestinal issues. Mm. You know, okay, so there was that. There was also a smart fridge that put you on a diet plan and once you had increased the amount of, of food or once once you had uh, used the amount of food that you could for that week then the fridge would kind of lock down so so you got these these big issues 
um, where if you wanted to add another person to your fridge plan, you'd have to, to call somebody up and yeah. within two weeks they might show up. And, you know, of, of course it's impossible because if you have like diabetes or you have an emergency, you need to get into the fridge. So the next exercise after that, as I said, <laughs> you have to stick with your horribly complicated device and now you have to calm the device down. Yeah. And so it was, it was a design example of, hey, most people in this room are not going to have the privilege of designing something from scratch. And even if you do, you need to understand how it exists in the environment and be annoyed with something first and, and be sensitive to that. And then once you're designing something in a calm way, you're usually designing, redesigning something that exists and just you know, doing the minimum amount of design work to, to get something useful again, because all the usefulness is there. And so people would just like hem and haw and get upset. They'd be like, oh, no, we have to deal with this. And I was like, yeah, this is just like what it's going to be like in the world of, you know, Samsung designs smart fridge and it fails horribly. <laughs> and then you come in and you're trying to, to help out the design. You know, what are you yeah. going to do? What can you turn in the status indicators for the smart underwear? Can you just take that into the medical industry and, and, and put that in in hospitals, you know? And alert people, you know, and how would you alert people? You know, you don't want to send the nurse a text on her phone. You want to just have a light that turns on, you know, that, that only some people can understand so that if their friends and family come in, they're not freaking out about whatever it is and it's not embarrassing. There's, there's plenty of ways to do these things. Um, so that's, that's the fun part. You get all the creativity of the people in the workshop designing horrible things and then having to deal with the horrible thing that they designed. I love that. I think it's kind of this flash of an image of a hospital where the machine is kind of shouting out, death imminent, death imminent, and like people start running in. That would be awful and it would be terrible. No, much more calmer and subtler solutions. So we have like 20, 30 more questions lined up for you, but we won't have time for them. So we'll definitely bring you on the show again, and we'll meet you in, in uh, Portugal as well. Uh, we want to finish off with uh, something I've just dubbed. I haven't told I just, you. I've just seen this in the yeah. notes now. You've I've, called it. I've dubbed it the Heptascale Challenge. Heptascale Challenge. <laughs> God. Just bring these things on me. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not going to explain this. It's, it's, it's not something to worry about. <laughs> we will pose four questions, two questions each, and you will grade them on a scale of one to seven in accordance with how much you agree or concur with that statement. Oh, seven's a lot and one's not very much. Yeah. So understanding the questions will not be hard, uh, but you may not comment or explain your answer until all the four questions have been asked. And then after that, you may, if you want, pick one of the questions to further explain your answer. There we go. <coughs> you go first, then. I can go first. Yeah. Uh, on a scale of one to seven, how good are you at backing up your online data? Seven. Ooh. Yeah, okay. So on a scale of one to seven, how good are you at snowboarding? Four. Mm. On a scale of one to seven, how happy are you with your second self, also known as your digital self? Six. And my second one. On a scale of one to seven, how calm are the notifi notifications that you receive? Four. <laughs> so. Excellent. Uh, Any one of those four you'd yeah. like to um, quickly elaborate on? Sure. Um, the... The one where I answered seven, which is how good are you at backing up your data? Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's the one I wanted to know that's more a, about. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very confident um, answer. I was uh, always obsessed with backing things up, starting when I was little. So I, I've had journals and notebooks since the age of four. I started doing analog recording on a tape recorder at age six as a way of making a time machine for my future self to go back in time and experience what it was like to be a kid again. I did that from age six to 12. And then I got a recorder, a video recorder. So then I recorded video and I still recorded audio and I had journals every day and I always stored them in the lowest resolution formats like text files that aren't going to corrupt across spaces. Then I had floppy disk drives and all sorts of things that I kept backing things up. I sent them online. I have an old Hotmail account with backups of everything too. And I just thought I was being really messy, but it turns out that I have never lost a hard drive, um, mm. except once, and I, I backed everything up, and I had printed versions of all the stories that I was writing, and I just found all the right. files, um, stored wow. somewhere else. Um, even the one spindle of CDs that I lost, um, somebody found it, and they said, hi, I have a bunch of CDs, can I send them to you in Boston? <laughs> 
So yeah. how did they get wow. to Boston? Like, <laughs> It's a whole <laughs> invisible story there. That's fantastic. So I've got multiple backups of, of you know, everything online, and I have audio backups and video backups. And, and the idea is to take so many backups that if you know two or three of them fail, I've still got some redundancy. I, I was raised by yeah. engineers, so my dad always told mm-hmm. me about redundancy and how you, how you back things up. Wow. And I never stored things in RAID arrays. They were always on regular hard drives, and, and I have... Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of the, I, I call them trilobites. I have all these like little external hard drives floating around, and you know, they just kind of exist. And, and I, I forget what I back up so much that when I look at it, it turns out that I backed up everything multiple times because I don't remember what I backed up. So I'm the messiest person ever digitally, but that ends up being really, really useful because I, I don't yeah. back up things once. I back them up like twenty times in all these different places. <laughs> That's amazing. That's I think really a lot good. of listeners are panicking now because that's the most confident answer I've ever heard. For that question, saying. yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't expect a seven there. That must, be, that must be sad. Thank you very, very much for joining us today, yeah, Amber. Yeah, it's been excellent. It's been really good fun. Yeah, this was fun. I like the questions yeah. at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you, um, well, in a few months. Yeah, see you yeah. soon. Hooray. All right. Yeah. Great. Nice. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. I'm just. I'm now. I'm thinking. It's just going to get so messy. Well, it's already messy, but I think it's going to get even more messy, isn't it? With the Internet of Things and yeah. all these devices. I, I, I was. I was thinking, reflecting now about kind of how we deal with the population density of the Internet of Things. Mm. Exactly. What, what can we do there to make mm. the, the, it all smarter? Then mm. that you know, one of the future challenges will be how do all these connected devices um, can they be aware of how dense the population is in their environment. It was the bird example. That's, that what, think yeah, about that's it. what I was thinking as well, yeah. When I was talking mm-hmm. about the birds, mm-hmm. one of the things that birds do when they're singing, they're actually announcing to other birds that they're there, yeah. and birds spread themselves out. Mm-hmm. They have breeding, they have a, like a, a zone that's theirs, mm-hmm. um, and they don't stay, they don't live mm-hmm. or forage too close together because there's not enough food, there's not enough, mm-hmm. there's too many, they won't have less competition for mm-hmm. the food and they won't have less competition <clears> for partners. So they automatically spread themselves out. We can't really do that in the same way with our Internet of Things and all our devices and everything. We've got them all crammed into our homes. Right. So what do we do when that when the kettle's making noises, mm. the dishwasher, the phone, the the TV, that my wristwatch, mm. the, the my, my my insulin pump? I mean, everything <laughs> singing to me and beeping at me. Well, you, uh, you you choose the sound you want for each device. But Which I was it would take me yeah. like half a year. I know. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a mm. freak in that, as mm. you know. My telephone mm. has different notification sounds for different services mm. so i can tell i know uh, if what what's making a noise at me and i can also mm. so i can value i can judge the importance and i also set up I'm, I, i've spent hours setting up my apple watch to make it work mm. the way i want it to and for the others it doesn't because the default settings suck really yeah. so yeah. the default settings is what's going to make or break the future device mm. i think so attention i mean it mm. still comes down to time how much time can you and sh- do you need to invest to make your technology calm mm-hmm. and 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 bearable and pay attention and, uh, to other technology yeah and give you the return mm. on investment mm. it, it should because mm. there's lots of great stuff we can do with all this data out there mm. and, and connectivity but I've, at times I feel like I'm drowning <laughs> already yeah so a few years have passed since that episode but um, that was from when was that 2016 yeah May 2016 yeah. Um, and I know that when it comes to calming our technology, both me and you have calmed our technology much more in subsequent years. Yeah, I have since deleted my Facebook account completely, which uh, for me has been fantastic at least. Uh, and I've also uh, used the setting on my iOS devices that actually reminds me to turn off, start turning off my devices and actually uh, locks me out from using, uh, well, most of the apps uh, automatically and i have to actually use some effort so there's friction for getting back in mm. uh, which helps me a lot uh, in the evenings i have to say yeah and i say i don't have facebook on any mobile any device anymore i, I don't use facebook, facebook much at all now um, and then i've removed notifications from almost everything um, there's, a, there's a couple of apps that still have notifications but by and large um, I need to take an active decision to go in to check things now um, on my mobile phone, um, mm. which means I've, I've got full control over when I get told about something, when I find out something's happened. 
Okay, I've still got to manage the kind of addiction side of things. That maybe I check something far too often still. But um, at yeah, least... especially when I've published something, I know I go back and see have there been any reactions and stuff like that. Mm. I need to get better at that still. I know. Yeah. So for me, mm. by and large, the the biggest problem is still the 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 non. So not my phone or tablet um, my, or my wristwatch or whatever. My biggest problem now is still the the other stuff. You know the the microwaves or the um, <laughs> yes. my my phone actually just made a noise and that's one of the things I, I heard about. Yeah, that's one of the things that's still on is actually the um, our smart locks on the house. So when someone mm. unlocks our front door, I get a mm. doorbell ding dong on my phone. Um, but but no, so it's microwaves, dishwashers, those kind of things. Those are still the worst things for me. That there's there's so little control over mm. what they do and how they do it. Yeah, it's mm. it's just they're just brutal. I even went uh, as far as to go get go watch a YouTube video to understand how I could take the device out that made a beep in our water heater. Which <laughs> so I actually used the screwdriver to get things out. <laughs> That's a YouTube video for everything. Yeah. Hmm. This podcast has been a repeat show from our archives. Let us know which of your favorite episodes over the years you think should be repeated for more people to listen to. Can I email in as well? You may. Good. That's my summer sorted. <laughs> so links and notes and a full transcript for this classic episode of UX Podcast can be found at uxpodcast.com. And don't forget to press follow or subscribe or whatever call to action button the thing you're listening to us in has presented to you. If you haven't done it already. <laughs> it seems like the listening thing part of podcast is kind of broken still. <laughs> really? We don't yeah. know. We don't know where people are listening. No, uh, no. Remember, you can contribute to funding the show by visiting uxpodcast.com slash support. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. get when you teach an android grammar i don't know james what do you get when you teach an android grammar a droid <laughs>